Howdy friends, my name is Milo, and today I want to tell you a story. A story which truly begins about 4,071 years and two or three months ago. But that is, of course, an inconceivable amount of time. So before we get there, I'd like to take you back a much more manageable 24 years to the year 1998. And just like that, I have dated the video, and now any comment not left in the year 2022 is going to be like, wow, look, it's a different time now, fuck you. Anyway, let me take you back. It's the spring of 1998. The film Titanic becomes the first to gross one billion dollars. And with it, Leonardo DiCaprio is granted the humanitarian task of making every single person on planet Earth question their sexuality. Across the world, MP3 players blast Neutral Milk Hotel's brand new release in an airplane over the sea, setting the stage for generations of pretentious audiophiles for years to come. Yeah, I'm kind of a fan of this, like, undercover indie band. You probably haven't heard of them. They're called Neutral Milk Hotel. And all is well in the sleepy English village of Holm Next to Sea, a village whose name is three hyphens too long. The little town is located on the east side of the rectangular bay known as the Wash, and it overlooks the cold, dark waters of the North Sea. It's a small town with a population of, at the time, about 300, and it contained exactly four things. The Church of St. Mary, with its main bell tower dating back to the 15th century, as well as the restored nave and chancel, which date back to the 1800s, a notably high population of migratory seabirds, and two sanctuaries to preserve said seabirds. A spring storm slams the coast, and while the inhabitants of the little town shudder their homes against the tempest, on the beach it uncovers some something ancient and sacred, something predating both the restored nave and chancel of St. Mary's Church, something older than its 15th century bell tower standing headstrong in the gale, and older still than the very first whispers of a church in a little town dating back to 1188 AD. On the shore that stormy night, as chunks of peat were ripped from the coast, something far older than St. Mary herself reached its shattered arms from its sandy tomb. For there, on the bank that night, emerged a circle of oak posts, built by unknown hands nearly four thousand years ago. This is the story of ancient timbers and the hands that felled them. The story of bird sanctuaries and backhoes. The story of protest and the deaf ears on which they fell. This is the story of- While people do attribute the 1998 storm to discovering Seahenge, in reality the locals had known about it for far longer. There was whispers of this sort of ephemeral place on the beach that would sometimes be visible and may or may not have actually existed. It was more the topic of local legend than anything else. It was only after the 98 storm that its existence was actually confirmed. As the next morning, there on the beach had emerged the remains of 55 oak posts. They were oriented in the shape of an ellipse, and it was about 18 feet long and 15 feet wide. And it is theorized that at one time these posts had stood about 10 feet tall. And the most intriguing part is that at the center of this ellipse stood the remains of an ancient oak tree. But instead of this circle being built around the remains of a living oak tree, it had instead been built around the remains of an oak which had been cut and put in the ground so that its root system was splayed up towards the sky. And this mysterious place on the beach next to the little town of Holm Next to Sea was dubbed Seahenge. Now, technically, this name is wrong, because Seahenge is not actually a henge. A henge is normally a circle of either stones or timber, which has a related earthenwork associated with it. This could be in the form of a trench or a mound or something like that, but either way, Seahenge does not have one of those, making its henge status rather nefarious, but we're gonna call it a henge anyway. This is like, Pluto isn't a planet bullshit. No, it's a fucking planet. I don't really care about semantics. There are actually three different types of henges. There is a class 1 henge, which will have a single entrance into the middle of the circle. There's a class 2 henge, which has two entrances that are opposite one another. And there's a class 3 henge, which has four entrances, which are on opposite sides of the circle. Now, if we were to class C henge as a henge, which I'm inclined to do because I'm not an asshole, it would be a class 1 henge. This is because it had a rudimentary doorway fashioned out of a Y branch, which would allow one access to the center circle with the remains of the oak tree in it. And people loved C henge. It earned a great deal of respect from the locals who had a very high regard for the pagan history of the area. And this history is of course littered across England and Ireland with countless examples of megalithic and Bronze Age architecture, with famous examples like the Thornborough Complex, or the Ring of Broadgar, or everyone's favorite henge that's made of stone, Avebury. Even though its meaning and the reason that it was built have been long lost, just being able to be in this place gave one enough feeling of sacredness that it still resonated with a lot of people in the modern world. But this fragile balance between the locals and their newfound jewel did not last long, as with its immersion from the sands, Seahenge went out of the frying pan and did Oh 
Oh, you wanna talk for a second? Yeah, uh, sure, be my guest. Wait, just like any news segment, there has to be an ag segment, ag, ad segment. And I'm very happy to say I just got my very first sponsorship and you are now contractually obligated to listen to me tell you about it. I'm sure these glasses are probably horribly reflecting, aren't they? I'll take them off for now. I am a big fan of nature. There's nothing that I love more than a waterfall or a rabbit jumping through a meadow or a bulldozer pushing a giant mountain of plastic garbage into the ocean. If you also like nature, then you're gonna love today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is Gaia Industries, and I am very proud to be working with a company which is started by someone who is still in college. I don't know how you found the time to start an entire company when you have to deal with writing essays and getting absolutely blitzed every weekend. Gaia Industries is a sustainable product company, and I got my own little box of goodies. So I gave all of the products here a little bit of a test run. Some of the items included in this box were these two bamboo combs, not one, not two, but four toothbrushes, a flat brush, or two flat brushes rather, but the other one's in the bathroom, and a water bottle, which appears to have escaped. That's the one I was the most excited for. Where the fuck is the- Oh, it's on my desk. And a water bottle. Uh, this brush is actually quite lovely for long hair because it has wooden bristles. Wooden bristles will transfer the oils from your scalp down your hair and keep your hair silky, your coat luscious. It will help you win the next pedigree dog show. I'm also a big fan of this water bottle because I mean, fucking look at it. It's made of bamboo and aluminum and it even holds water in it. Oh, it went all over my white frat boy boat shoes. That was not how that was supposed to go. And for all of you hippie tea enthusiasts out there, this water bottle even comes with a little tea diffuser. And the wonderful people at Gaia Industries uh, actually sent me a little tea bag with it, which I think is adorable. Ah, oh, it smells very nice. I think it's chamomile. But yes, this uh, fits right in here, which will um, ensure that your tea bag uh, does not go up into your mouth when you were drinking, causing you to choke to death like a baby sea turtle on a plastic bag. It's probably the part of these that speaks to me the most is that all of them are made of bamboo, which is sustainable, fast growing, and a wonderful alternative to using plastic disposable products. If you would like to get some of these quality products yourself, you can use promo code CURIOUS on the Gaia Industries website in order to get 25% off your order. And my my patrons get a secret promo code only available to them, which will give them 35% off their order. Oh yeah, also the toothbrushes are really soft. They don't feel like you're rubbing your teeth off with sandpaper. This is rather therapeutic, actually. Again, I would like to give a big thank you to Gaia Industries, not only for trying to make the world a slightly healthier and more sustainable place, but also helping me pay my rent. Links and promo codes will be in the description if you are interested in following through with that at the end of the episode. Otherwise, let's get right back to it. Oh, what was that? I think I blacked out for a second. At first, the news of Seahenge's discovery buzzed in Home Next to Sea. This is completely understandable because the local's bar of entertainment was living in England. But news of the discovery spread like a case of mono at a frat party. And as more and more people heard about the site, the little town became host to a lot of guests. It attracted day trippers, amateur archeologists, and people who were drawn towards the religious significance of the site. But at the time, the town did not have enough funding to undergo an actual archeological dig or any sort of exploratory excavation at the site. And they were perfectly content in just having some guests come by to look at the site. Everyone gets to soak it in, enjoy the fun, and then go home. And that balance worked for a while. News of the discovery eventually reached the Norfolk Archaeological Unit, or the NAU, which is a now defunct archaeological group which had previously helped excavate the West Runton Mammoth in 1990, which was a fairly significant find. It was the remains of an 11-ton steppe mammoth that is the largest mammoth skeleton ever found. Oh no, steppe mammoth, I'm stuck in a glacial deposit. <laughs> That's so fucking stupid. Now thankfully, every single person who interacted with the site was like, I'm going to completely respect it, I'm not going to touch it in any way, and frankly, it just being here is enough for me. Oh wait, that didn't happen. Because once you find something cool, everyone's like, yeah, that's pretty neat, but I want to know more about it. And of course the question on everyone's mind was, well, how old is it? But since nobody in the area could remember building it and it didn't have a valid form of state ID, they had to find some other way to tell how old it was. So of course they resorted to the third most effective way to figure out something's age. Those of course being a driver's license, a birth certificate, and a chainsaw. Later in 1998, a group of individuals decided that they were going to figure out how old it was by getting a sample of the wood. This was to be done by using dendrochronological dating, which typically relies on a core sample of a piece of wood when doing professional archeology. span However, the people who were dating this site did not have a core sampler with them, so they decided to remove a piece of the center stump using a chainsaw, in an act which could be described as gross negligence or archeological terrorism. As I'm sure all of you are well aware, there are many different ways to date a site, and every single dating method will involve the oldest member of the team making a joke about how you could take the artifact to dinner first. But the way that they decided to date this site 
it was using a process known as dendrochronology, which is my favorite type of dating. And I've talked about it on TikTok before, but I doubt any of you remember that because that was when I had like 10,000 followers. So I'm gonna explain it again. Most forms of dating have a pretty significant margin of error. Of course, as technology progresses, things like radiocarbon dating become ever more accurate, but there will always be a plus or minus of years on either side of the given date. But the wonderful thing about dendrochronology is it not only narrows things down to the exact year that they were made, it can narrow things down to the season that they were made. But it's not applicable everywhere. Where things like radiocarbon dating rely on natural material, whether it's bone or charcoal or food material, dendrochronology can only be done on pieces of wood where you can get an accurate sample of rings. As any of you who have ever been outside would know, trees, not unlike me, have rings. They grow at a rate of one ring per year, and the thickness of these rings is dependent on the rainfall and climatic changes of its growing season. Years with more rain will have thicker rings, less rain have thinner rings, you get how this works. But because of this, every tree in a given area is exposed to the same conditions, same rainfall, moisture, and heat. So if you were to cut down a bunch of different trees, their rings would line up, more or less. And by lining all of these rings up, you can make one continuous growth ring chart dating back for as long as you have wood. So as awful as it is that this site was vandalized with a chainsaw, it did yield some very interesting results. The sample from the center, as well as samples taken from the stumps around it, proved that these were the remains of between 15 and 20 different oak trees that had all been felled in the spring of 2049 BCE. And if that isn't the most awesome shit, I don't know what is. Now, 4,000 years ago, this area was not a beach, it was a salt marsh. And this structure would have been located right on the edge of the forest, just in the salt marsh. And the England which the builders of this site occupied was kind of like today's England if you were in a fever dream. The builders would have shared a continent with the Eurasian Auroch, the ancestor of our modern cattle. Not only this, but they would have seen herds of reindeer migrating up and down the continent. And only a few thousand years before this construction, they would have shared an island with the enormous Irish elk. It would have been a wildly different world, and one that is almost difficult to wrap your head around. And it really makes makes you think of how beautiful a world would be without London. That's gonna age really poorly if this war heats up. Now the area was starting to draw a lot of visitors, not just from the immediate area, but from well outside the town. Not only were there day and weekend trippers coming from all across the country, but it was also now seen as a place of Druidic worship. And this drew in a whole host of people from pagan and Druidic communities, as you can see here in a picture that I will let you draw your own conclusions about. This new traffic to this small town was beginning to cause a lot of problems. As spring crept into summer, there was notable impact that these visitors were having on the migratory seabird communities. With this place being so important for migratory seabirds, the presence of all these new tourists was not unnoticed by the wildlife foundations in the area. And it drew the attention of the Norfolk Wildlife Trust, the group who managed the two different wildlife refuges that abutted either side of this site. So the Norfolk Wildlife Trust, or the NWT, decided to team up with the NAU. And together, they decided to tell people to fuck off. And people listened, they respected the boundaries, and they never went to the site again. Good night, everyone, and God bless. I've already made that joke in a video before. <laughs> That's okay. I'm kidding, of course. People didn't fucking listen. Now, if all these little interactions had been a grease fire, what happened next would be the equivalent of help arriving in the form of a five-year-old with a bucket of water. Because now news of Seahenge is in the mainstream media, and the- It is now the February of 1999, and it is nearly a year after the discovery of Seahenge. Growing coverage by the media has resulted in there being a large outcry for action to protect the site. Initially, the site isn't even deemed worthy of excavation due to how difficult it would be to operate there. But eventually, a group called English Heritage gets involved. English Heritage manages a whole bunch of different historical sites throughout England. Things like Windmill Hill, Avebury, and most famously, Stonehenge. And by early spring, English Heritage, or EH, comes up with a plan, and they decide to hold a public meeting meeting with the people of the town. The people of the town are thrilled about this. They show up ready to discuss and figure out what would be best for the local community and also serve the best interests of the historical preservation. Now, in this meeting in May, English Heritage does not come to negotiate or discuss. Instead, they tell the local townspeople that they plan to preserve the site by removing it and that excavation would begin tomorrow. And people are fucking pissed. England is showing up somewhere, finding something I like on somebody else's land, and then just taking it without asking is like, 
kind of what they fucking do. Excavation at this site was really, really hard. Operating heavy machinery on this beach was an absolute pain in the ass because the shifting sands and tides meant that you could only dig for two to four hours a day, which meant that there was a lot of time when the archeologists were not on the site, which gave even more time for protesters to surround the site and make work even more difficult. <laughs> Libby Purvis of the Times wrote an article about the site in 1999. The title of her article is A Transient Beauty, and I think that is just a perfect way to describe this site. People wanted Seahenge to be something that was magical and mystical, something which would eventually be covered by the sands again, only to reappear years later. And she wrote in her article, Seahenge inspires a sense of mystery that it will lose when it's in a museum, which is a very interesting argument against this traditional form of archeology, span where maybe it's important to just leave something where it is. And even though there could be information to be learned, it works best to just leave it. Contemporary archeologists have to grapple with the fact that they are not entirely to every site on Earth, and that it really should be up to the local community who are the most impacted by the site to decide what happens to it. But I'll get into the ethical part of this later. You thought it was about to get boring, but I swear to God I'm getting to the hippie druid part now. The local community who don't want their henge stolen decide to team up with the only group that makes sense. That, of course, being the Council of British Druid Orders, which is a council between multiple different druidic groups throughout England. And they have a very, very deep connection to a lot of these megalithic sites. Well, this isn't a megalith, but... Um, mega wood. Oh, that sounds awful. They have a deep connection to all of these meadow wood. Wooge <laughs> God damn it. I'm gonna get a drink of water. Give me a second. <laughs> the Council of British Druid Orders find a lot of these Bronze Age sites to be very important to their religious beliefs. And they are most well known for their celebrations that they will hold, I believe, yearly at Stonehenge. But either way, they're big fans of all this stuff. And because it involves their religious beliefs, they are very passionate about defending it. But even the Druids knew they weren't strong enough to take this out. So they call on something far more powerful. I feel like I'm describing the plot to like a fucking in Skyrim sky, sky, sky quest. And the Council of British Druid Orders call on Buster Nolan. Buster Nolan is a tree activist, and I had a absolutely wonderful time looking through all of his social media pages. He's got this cool hippie website that I'm sure all of you Waldorf kids out there will feel perfectly comfortable looking at. He also has a Twitter uh, on which he describes himself as a tree man. Not only that, but he is a hemp and cannabis activist, a defender of Seahenge, a poet, and a vocalist for a band called Anomaly Point? I'll get back to Seahenge in a minute, but I'm really curious about the fact that he's part of a band. And his band has a YouTube channel, a 15 minute video called Stonehenge. You have piqued my interest, Buster Nolan. What's going on there? Those, uh, are those oak leaves? Oh my god, are those marijuana? Okay, we'll go back to Seahenge now, but I had to share that with you because I like to have fun here. At this point in the story, there are distinct sides forming. On one side, there's the NWT, EH, and the NAU. And on the other side, there are civilians, Druids, and Forbes' sexiest man alive, Buster Nolan. Peaceful protests by the Druids in the local community have made excavation incredibly difficult up until this point. And so the two sides decide to meet together to discuss a common ground. The people who wanted the excavation to be stopped went into it fully thinking that there was going to be some place to negotiate. But as you won't be surprised, the Norfolk Archaeological Unit had no intention on stopping what they're doing. Instead, the intention of this meeting seemed to be a bit of a weird publicity stunt, where the archaeological unit would have a public forum where they could be seen listening to the feedback from the community, but not actually change anything. So the Norfolk Archaeological Unit decides to listen to the protesters, and then take out a court injunction threatening to press charges against anyone who doesn't stop protesting at the site. And despite all of the protests from the locals, the last timber was pulled on July 19th. And with that, Seahenge had been removed completely. What, are you expecting a smash cut into the next section? Because it's not gonna happen. So what became of Seahenge? Okay, so now that the site has been completely removed against the better interests of just about every single person involved, let's see what sorts of valuable information we learned from this day. After the excavation, the timbers were taken to a place called Flag Fen. Flag Fen is another Bronze Age site which specializes in the preservation of saturated wood. 
This is because one of the prominent features at Flag Fen was a one kilometer long causeway which stretched through a marsh. This was an incredibly difficult preservation process because the wood was not only saturated, but had also been exposed to the salt from the ocean, as well as the twice daily cycle of drying and then being wet again by the ocean waves. And so the site underwent a vast preservation process, primarily involving the salt being removed from the timbers by washing it repeatedly in fresh water. And eventually the timbers were washed thoroughly and stabilized and were able to be displayed while dry. And the excavation and subsequent analysis did yield a little bit of interesting information. For example, it confirmed that the remains had come from about 20 different oak trees. Archaeologists were also able to identify different axe marks in the trees, which indicated that the trees were felled with about 35 different axes. It was also found that the central stump had been moved with a series of honeysuckle ropes which were actually still present and buried at the site. And the analysis also confirmed that it had been constructed in late spring to early summer, as was already apparent by the chainsaw experiment. Now what's really frustrating about all of this is that all of this information is not that useful. As interesting as it is to sit here and imagine that 35 axes were used to cut down these timbers and they came from 20 different oak trees, and that the center stump was moved with honeysuckle rope, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't get us any closer to learning what this site was for, which really would be the most interesting thing to know. Some people theorize that it was a landmark as it would have been very easily visible on the flat salt marsh. Others think that it may have been a sacred oak tree that had fallen either from natural causes or from some sort of conflict and was given this sort of shrine as a place to remember it by. Another theory, and my personal favorite, is that it was a funeral plinth. People theorize that a body was supposed to be put on top of the upturned roots of the tree so that birds and the elements could take their toll until there's nothing but bones left. Perhaps a symbolic way of returning to the earth in druidic belief. But in all the research I did on this site, I could not find any reason why people believe that, and it really does just sound like something that people came up with because it sounds really fucking awesome. Huh, we found a tree. What do you think it could be? Well, they probably put dead people on top of it so that vultures could eat their eyeballs. The problem is there is not nearly enough information to justify the complete removal of the site. Even the locals were willing to compromise to at least just have the site displayed in their village, but they didn't even get that, with half of the site now on display in the Lynn Museum about 20 miles away. Which I guess brings us promptly to... Seahenge is gone. If you go to the little town of Holm next to the sea, the only evidence you'll find of it is a replica built next to a fish and chips shop. This is a fascinating case study for anyone looking to pursue archaeology or just to learn more about it, because it doesn't uphold the romantic idea that we have of archaeology. What happened at Seahenge is nothing short of a tragedy, a perfect example of conflict of interest which is overruled by those who hold the highest degree. And it is important to look at this from both sides. From an archaeologist's perspective, a site like this has the potential to yield some groundbreaking information. And there's almost a sense of obligation on the side of the archaeologists, that the site was unattended for on the beach, not only exposed to the ocean waves and the elements, but also to the tourists and day trippers who wanted to see the site. On the flip side, the local community loved this location. Not only did it boost the local economy of the small town, but it was also a point of pride, a site which they were proud to have and proud to protect and respect. While both of those sides are understandable, the action taken by professional archaeologists in this case was far from diplomatic. In the field of archaeology, there seems to be an unspoken belief, especially historically, that any site wherever it crops up is the property of archaeologists. This of course manifested in nothing short of grave robbing historically, but this is a wonderful modern example of it. And it raises the important question of what is to be done in a situation like this. Don't locals have the right to decide what is to be done with a discovery on their land? If an archaeological site is found on someone's property, it is within their right to decide whether or not they want an archaeologist to excavate at it. And they are well within their rights to deny that privilege for better or for worse. So what is to be done in a case like this? The beach on which Seahenge was found was within town boundaries. And it seems that in this case, it should be the responsibility of the town to come together to decide what is to be done on their land. And the most frustrating part of all of this is that there is a way that this could have all been avoided. Through positive discourse and discussion throughout the community, I'm sure that archeologists and the locals could have come to some sort of consensus onto what is to be done with the site. But unfortunately, there was no discussion. And in a matter of months, Seahenge was lost from the site that it occupied for nearly four thousand years. But this story has not a happy ending, but a poetic one. In 1999, when the controversy over Seahenge was at its peak, another site was discovered. And this site was found only 400 feet away from Seahenge. 
and it was named Holm 2. Holm 2 was bigger than Seahenge, almost 40 feet in diameter. And in the center, rather than the upturned trunk of an ancient oak, were two logs lying flat next to one another. It had a similar outer palisade made of wood logs, and a woven fence made of wicker within the walls. And the most incredible part of this is, after doing a dendrochronological date, it was found that Holm 2 dates to the exact same year as Seahenge. And this is the only example in all of England where two ancient structures were built at the exact same time as one another. And I find it rather beautiful that this site chose to show itself right as its sibling was being ripped from the ground. But even as its sister site was lost, Home 2 somehow survived the fray. And even after the dust of controversy had settled and Seahenge had been removed, Holm 2 remained. Today, visitors at Holm Next to the Sea can find five things. The Church of St. Mary with its steeple dating back to the 15th century and restored nave and chancel from the 1800s. A notably high population of migratory seabirds, two sanctuaries to preserve those seabirds, and the remains of a 4,071-year-old sacred site that has seen ice melt, sands shift, and mankind rise. It is the last of its kind, an ancient god from a time immortal, an ephemeral place, a transient beauty. I'd like to thank you all very much for watching. If you'd like to keep up to date with what I do on this channel, make sure to subscribe. And normally with all these videos, I try to do a live premiere. So if you were here for this one, it was wonderful having you. And if not, I look forward to seeing you next time. I'd also like to give a big thank you to Gaia Industries for sponsoring today's video. Make sure to check out the links to all that good shit in the description. And if you'd like a little bit more of a personal glimpse into my life, feel free to follow me on Instagram or Twitter or even join my Discord if you're so inclined. Links to all of that will also be in the description, bio, whatever it is. And thank you all so much for 100,000 subscribers. That shit is insane. I still need to figure out where to hang my plaque, but considering I'm only going to be living here for another fucking two months, I really am not too bothered about it right now. Also get excited because uh, the next place I'm going to live, I'm going to have an actual set, so I'm not using this fucking green screen anymore. Here, here's the whole shot. This is what I'm working with. Isn't this professional? I'd also like to give a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for making what I do here possible. Your names will all be in the credits of this video. Thank you so much for your support. Remember to stay curious, stay inquisitive, and most importantly, next time you see a tree, remember to thank Buster Nolan. Play us out, Buster. Let's go! Let's go!